Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is lecture number 12 in the history series, Is Postmodernism a Period? Follows on from lecture 11 about the relation between modernism and postmodernism. So there are a number of ways of thinking about this question, uh, but what they all have in common is doubt about the idea that postmodernism will end. Because if postmodernism doesn't end, then it's not a period like every other period in the history of art. It would be something more like a condition. Um, so I have uh, three examples of different ways of thinking about this. And then the last one is a speculative parallel with what happened in Chinese art and it's quote unquote postmodernism. So this idea, actually this word, that postmodernism and condition, it's due to Jean-Francois Lyotard. Um, and the idea is basically uh, that postmodernity is a condition or a mode of culture rather than a period. It's, uh, it's a period after periods, after the periods of art are over. Um, it's something that happens when the sequence of periods collapses um, and reaches a state of indeterminacy from which it can't recover. Among the people who have written about this are the art historians Rosalind Krauss and Evelyn Bois. Um, among others, a number of art historians have been influenced by Lyotard um, in arguing this way. And I put on the slide here some of the different terms that have been used by Krauss and Bois in particular to describe modernism and postmodernism when postmodernism is thought of as a condition. A couple of these will look familiar from the last lecture, form and formless instead of anti-form. Um, but a couple of other ones won't. Um, they're, 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 they're new, they're specific to art history. Um, so for example, the third one, modernism is characterized by figure and ground. So like if you're, you're drawing or sculpting a, a figure, there's a figure and then there's a ground. And modernism is all about that relationship. Um, if you were a painter or an art student in the 19th century, it'd be really, really obvious what was figure and what was ground. If you're a modernist, not so obvious. If you think of like a Mondrian painting, it's not really clear are the stripes in a Mondrian painting, the figure and the, the color rectangles, the ground. Uh, it's in question, but it's in play. It's something that was thought about. Whereas in postmodernism, that idea has been given up um, and all that's left is ground, and which also means material, as you see just above that. And uh, just below that is the idea of rhythm as opposed to pulse. And pulse is a word um, that Krauss and Bois um, took from um, their reading of a uh, French surrealist, Georges Bataille, uh, who comes up in another uh, lecture. Pulse here means, uh, doesn't mean like heartbeat pulse, it means an irregular pulse. Um, so modernism is all about rhythm, meaning that it has to do with um, that it has to do with uh, regular, repetitive units of structure in architecture and in, in painting and drawing and so on. Um, but postmodernism has to do with pulse, meaning that um, regular intervals, uh, modules, shapes, units, and so on break down uh, in favor of irregularity. That's very much a, a leotard uh, kind of idea as well. So that, that's a long list and it could go on. You could see creation as opposed to empathy, down, I mean entropy down at the bottom. Um, you could, that list could be made uh, much longer. It's also been a common criticism of scholars like Krauss that they're really just playing a kind of a simple game where they're, they're taking modernist traits and just finding the opposites of them. So they're really not creating something that's that different and certainly not something which is no longer a period, but is somehow outside of history. That's been an ongoing criticism of this kind of um, conceptualization of art history. So if postmodernism is a condition, it could have a beginning, like the ones I listed in the last lecture, 1962, 1964, and so on. But it doesn't have an end. Uh, and that means that the West, uh, in particular, may be stuck in postmodernism indefinitely your list of periods and megaperiods then could look something like this. The first megaperiod would be art periods. There would be classical, medieval, renaissance, baroque, and any number of others. The second megaperiod, so to speak, would be the condition of postmodernism, which would have a beginning but wouldn't have an end. So in a way, in this idea, uh, in this way of thinking, um, 
history conceived as a succession of periods may have come to an end. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're um, in a state that has never happened before because there have been many times and places when history has not been thought of as a succession of periods. For example, the Christian Middle Ages um, in Europe um, when religious painters and sculptors and architects were not thinking of themselves as, as uh, living in a certain historical period, but thinking of themselves as uh, serving the church or serving piety and having other, um, having other um, interests. So there's one particular uh, way of thinking about this that, um, that caught on for a while uh, very widely. Uh, has to do with the end game. The end game is, is a term from chess. So I, um, I'm not much of a chess player. I only, all you think I know about this, I know from reading uh, up about it on, on you know, things like Wikipedia. Basically though, it seems to me that the, what a chess endgame is, is that it's a, it's a state of a chess game in which usually only a few pieces remain on the board, like you see here. So it's not immediately clear if one person can force a win or whether the play is going to continue indefinitely because you can move pawns and in this case kings and pawns only back and forth and back and forth. So end game problems for um, chess specialists are especially difficult. End games can be very slow moving and seem to be repetitive. And so uh, there have been books written on this subject so that um, chess players can tell when they are in an end a condition of endless play uh, or when they can uh, force a draw, when they can, if they, and, or even force the, um, or even force the bait. So there's, in a sense, a lot of freedom in an end game because there are a lot of different places to move as opposed to earlier stages in the game. One of the people who was interested in chess as a metaphor was the French art historian Hubert Damisch, who pictured modernism as a chess game. So this is not part of end game theory in particular, but this is an art historian who was interested in thinking of all of modernism um, as a chess game. The, his basic idea was that at any given moment, say for example, randomly 1935, if you're working as an artist in 1935, only certain moves are possible. For example, in 1935, Dada was finished, but surrealism was ongoing, so you could make a surrealist move uh, in your art. So Damish's idea is that if, uh, to the extent that art is like chess, um, as an artist, you play the part of the game in which you find yourself. Uh, if you find yourself at the very beginning, there are certain ways to attack. In the middle, there's lots of strategies, named strategies and expected moves and so on, but a lot of limitations as well. But in the end game, there's a lot of moves you can make that have no consequence at all. So you have a lot of freedom. You can play for a really long time, and, but there may not be any point in playing. That's what it would be like if actually we're in the condition of end game chess in postmodernism. So one of the artists who was interested in endgame theories uh, was the artist Sherry Levine, um, who is most famous um, for making prints of modernist photographs. This is uh, on the right is her um, re-photograph of a Walker Evans photograph from 1936. Um, and she wrote a couple of interesting uh, statements um, saying things like the world is already full of art and objects and why would we want to add anything to it? Um, so this is, this is an example of a kind of art um, that was informed by thinking along uh, these lines um, about a, 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 a state of affairs where many, many things are possible, and you know, art is certainly that way these days, uh, but where it's almost impossible to make a move that has any consequence and, uh, and very, very hard to know if your moves are leading anywhere. Some end games can continue indefinitely. Um, Evil and Bois said that he imagines end game as an act of mourning. He, he wrote a book on uh, painting, collected a series of essays on, on uh, painting, um, in which he says at one point um, that painting in postmodernism slowly recognizes that its hopes for a future are not going to come true. And so painters turn to the business of, quote, working through the end of painting, figure out what to do now that everything is over. Um, this is one of uh, Via Selman's um, uh, paintings. Actually, she does a lot of drawings, but this one's a painting of a falling star. She uses, um, she, she uh, draws and paints um, in a very uh, realistic way, often with a graphite pencil from photographs. It's something that you could do. It's something that um, in a, 
in, a, in an abstract sense, anyone could do, and they could do forever. So the endlessness of it uh, is the kind of thing that Evil and Bob imagines as mourning, active mourning. Then there are claims that postmodernism of this sort uh, also means the end of art history. And the most influential argument about that is Arthur Danto's. His books have been very influential, I think especially in China. There's a, there's a, there are a number translated and, and often they're, on, um, they're often on taught um, and other parts of the world a little uh, less so. Um, but this particular book um, has been uh, widely translated and widely reviewed and taught. I think the usual reading of this book, what most people's understanding of the book is that he's arguing like it implies, like the title implies, that art itself ended, especially after Warhol, um, which, as I said in the last lecture, Warhol is when Danto thinks that postmodernism started. So the, the usual reading of this book is that after Warhol, art itself ended, uh, because after him, um, uh, there was there was the possibility of doing anything you wanted to, so there was there wasn't any interest in going forward in art. But actually, the argument is that art history ended, because you could make any kind of art. That meant that artists no longer had to worry about history or their place in it. So it's really an argument about the end of art history, because of the um, a loss of meaning. Art history wouldn't have any meaning or significance if it was only a catalog of artists rather than a narrative with consequences for the present. And that's why he titled it End of Art. There's a philosophic dispute about when this uh, change took place. Some art historians say the same thing about Duchamp's fountain. There he is sitting in front of uh, the fountain, the urinal. Um, so Danto claims that, uh, that the beginning of postmodernism and the end of art history was 1964 with the Brilla boxes. Um, but the Belgian art historian Thierry de Duve has proposed that Duchamp's fountain is the end of art. And his reason, the reason he gives is that it, the fountain is ontologically the same as a urinal. And so ontology, the study of states of being, forms of being in philosophy, what, he, what uh, de Duve means is that that urinal behind Duchamp there actually is a urinal. So ontologically, in terms of being, it's actually ceramics and, uh, and uh, bits of pipe. Uh, it's physically a urinal. Whereas Warhol's Brillo boxes are only an echo because they are epistemologically the same as actual Brillo boxes. Epistemology, the philosophic um, study of knowledge. And so when you stand back from Warhol's Brillo boxes, they look just like Brillo boxes, but actually they're not. They're painted and printed copies. So they're only epistemologically the same, not ontologically the same. So I, I thought I'd put that screen in if you're interested in philosophic debates. Um, and it also makes a big historical difference because um, if you think that um, Thierry de Duve has the better claim, then um, the end of art or the end of art history or the beginning of postmodernism could be dated to Duchamp's fountain um, and not to 1964. So in either case, postmodernism would be the name of a period after art history. And then your timeline would look something like this. You'd have before art history, and then you'd have a period of art history, and then you'd have a period after art history. Um, so this is another possibility for, um, for uh, a timeline or, or periods and mega periods. Okay, the last topic here is a little hypothetical parallel that I would like to make with, uh, with Chinese art. So Chinese art history, especially ink brush painting, uh, also went through a period with postmodern qualities. Um, from the late Ming Dynasty onward, um, Chinese ink brush painters tried to develop their own styles. So we're talking, um, we're talking 15th, 16th, 17th century. The idea was, as an artist, that you had to be, your work would be best if it was recognizable at a glance. And the result was a whole lot of very exaggerated styles. Uh, in fact, several groups of the Chinese ink brush painters were known as strange or eccentric guai. Um, this is one of the best ones of them. Bada Shanren, he called himself, um, and he painted oh, some of the strangest 
birds and fish like that you could ever imagine. They all look really warped. Uh, and in other pictures, they also look sort of puzzled or hypnotized or like they're laughing hysterically. And nobody really knows how to read these pictures. I mean, there's a general cultural context, of course, but they're immediately recognizable. Nobody did uh, things like he did. Um, and he's one of a number um, in the, the end of the Ming Dynasty up to the 17th century that were like this. Um, trying to be more and more different from people around them. So as in the West, artists began to develop what's called in the West signature styles, or personal quirks and so on. Um, a little bit like Damien Hirst's shark and formaldehyde, you know, immediately it's Damien Hirst or Jeff Koons, balloon animals and so on. And later inkbrush painting evolved in this uh, pluralist atmosphere in other words, uh, an innumerable number of styles, eccentric painters, um, with uh, very, very different styles, very short-lived schools, um, and very idiosyncratic works, and artists distinguished by single exaggerated traits or repeated tricks. All of those are also characteristics of postmodern and contemporary Western art. Um, it's uh, way beyond Hearst and Kuhn's. You could, you could list hundreds or thousands of artists, um, uh, contemporary artists, um, who uh, do work that you can recognize more or less immediately because they have um, signature practices. So this raises a possibility uh, of comparison with the West. Chinese inkbrush painting, of course, doesn't resemble postmodern Western painting. But if you look at the chronology, it is interesting that Chinese quote-unquote postmodernism, it's not what anyone ever called it, but that's for the sake of this comparison, that's what I'm calling it. Chinese postmodernism began about 250 years ago. On that chart, I put it like the early 1700s. Um, and it showed no signs of ending when it was uh, completely swept away uh, by the revolution. The parallel then suggests that China had a form of postmodernism, at least as far as these traits that I listed on the last screen, long before the West did, and they didn't ever get out of that period. Uh, it became more and more fragmented, the artist styles became more and more different, pronounced and more individual, and then it was finally completely ended by radical political change. So that would seem to be an argument uh, that it is possible uh, that this Western postmodernism is a condition and that it will continue until something fundamentally disrupts the economy and the politics. So here's one more timeline for a conclusion. If you think this way, then it's possible that art history doesn't have a nice neat structure or periods and, and mega periods. It might end with suspension points, dot, 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 leading on towards some future that no one can imagine because it would be then the case that there were periods, normal periods, and then there are maybe abnormal periods, postmodernism and whatever might happen next. Um, so in the next lecture, the topic is contemporary art, which is the main candidate these days for something that comes after postmodernism.